So we're starting a brand new series today for our Lenten journey together. And we are calling it The Ordinary Road because it's on the ordinary road where our God meets us. And it's in these ordinary moments where we come face to face with the God that is. That God meets us in the ordinary. When I'm on the floor playing with my kids and I see them smiling, God is in their faces, even though if I struggle to get back up off the floor. Um, While I'm working out to take care of my health and my body's aching and sore, I could see that God has knit my body together. When I'm doing the dishes, I sit there and I know that God has taken care of me because I'm able to put away my food. Because his eye is on the sparrow and I know he's also watching me as well. When I'm in the car, I'm listening to music and I'm seeing faces pass by me. And I see God in the faces of those around me. God meets us in the ordinary spaces of life. It's the journey we are taking this Lenten season to recognize the hand of God in our lives and that his hand is all over our lives. And we need this journey because we long to find God on the mountaintop. Those experiences are so much easier to highlight God's activity in our life because they're big, they're bold, they're grandiose. It's a lot of the reasons why we come to church. It's easy to see the hand of God at church in the worship, in the prayers, in the faces of those that we pass the peace with, of the lingering after service just because we want to tarry a little bit longer. It's spaces like this where heaven and earth seem a little closer together. It's the story of the Asbury revival that happened all not all that long ago where a couple college students were just praising and worshiping God. Then all of a sudden revival broke out. And they tarried and they prayed and they spent time there together. And people came from all over to experience the tangible presence of God in that space. It's a story of those that pilgrimage to Israel to walk where Jesus walked, to see where he prayed, where he cried, where he did miracles, to maybe even remember your baptism in the Jordan where Jesus was once baptized. And these serve a purpose, and they're good, and they're beautiful, and God is there, and God is present there, and he's redeeming and renewing and restoring creation in those spaces. But God is also elsewhere. We can find God in the ordinary, the mundane, the everyday, and it's in these ordinary moments that it's often overlooked that God is there because they are seemingly insignificant. But it's on this ordinary road where we meet our extraordinary God. The ordinary road isn't spectacular. It's ordinary. It's every day. It's the road that we travel the most. But we tend to have a problem on this ordinary road. Um, Let me rephrase that. I tend to have a problem on this ordinary road. I'm not a patient individual. Um, Waiting on God to show up in the ordinary is not my favorite thing to do. I long for the grandiose instead. Also, it's much easier to recognize God in the grandiose moments than it is in the ordinary moments. So I would say that we have a problem, that our problem is we're not the most patient of individuals. How many of you get irritated at red lights? How many of you get irritated that the commercials keep coming on? Or that your computer decides to just update whenever it wants to when you're trying to get to it? Or you're trying to print at work and the person before you did not unjam the printer? <sighs> or if you have a toddler that decides that they want to pick out their outfit and now you're late for Ash Wednesday service. I don't know who on earth that would be. But it is too slow. I want things to happen quicker than they do. We want things to move quicker. I would like my kids to behave right the first time. I would like my waistline to shrink the first day I start eating well. I would like my treatments to not take so long so we could be healthy. We want our bank account to increase to get that promotion without having to do all the hard work that's necessary for that to happen. We would like life to run much more like a Keurig where you just plop it in and boom, you have coffee. You have coffee. Insert coin, get what you want. Because our time is precious, right? It's fleeting. We literally just had a service on Ash Wednesday where you came forward and we said, guess what? You're going to die. Woohoo, right? And you're, even better yet, your day is like, your life is like a mist. 
here today and gone tomorrow. And we go into the Lenten season with this understanding of our mortality and that things are fleeting. So it's like, chop, 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 let's get this thing going because my time is precious. And we bring this, I want it now mentality into our relationships with one another and with God. But can I be a little honest and a little vulnerable with you this morning? Um, As a newer pastor here on staff, I want you to love me now. I want you to like me now. When I mess up, I want you to just give me the benefit of the doubt and just say, oh, he didn't mean to. It's fine. I want that now. But the truth is, that's just not how our lives work. That's not how relationships work. I have to do the hard work of getting to know you, of showing up in the spaces that are meaningful to you, to being in the spaces where you are in deep sorrow, and I don't have anything to say, and I just sit there, and I keep showing up to remind you that God's grace is available to you. I need to show up in those spaces where I royally screw up and do something dumb. It's coming. And I have to apologize and own it for what I did. I want the relationship now. I want the trust now. I want connection now. That's not how life works. That's not how relationships work. We are wired for deep connection. We need vulnerability. We need proximity with one another. The ordinary road isn't an expressway. We can't just speed it up and make it happen. We can't just drop off of 294, go to the Oasis, get Starbucks, and jump right back on. It's just not how life works. The way God meets us in the ordinary road is one that is without the trumpet blowing. It occurs naturally, and it occurs over time. And it occurs in the same way that we foster relationships with one another, over meaningful connection, over phone calls, over coffee. Over time spent together, shared memories, happy moments and sad moments. That's how we build our relationship with one another. And that's how we build our relationship with God. And today on this ordinary road, God meets us in prayer. And it is by prayer that God decides to shape and God decides to form us. Pastor I Love puts it this way. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do what you want him to do, but it's to be properly formed. Prayer is to form and shape us, to build that reflex of trust when things go wrong in our lives and things often go wrong in our lives. If there's anything that we have in consistency with one another is that we've all been hurt or we've hurt someone else. And in today's scripture reading, as we continue on in the service, we're going to hear the hurt of a barren woman couldn't have kids, but was married to a man who didn't quite understand her predicament. There was another woman, a part of the relationship, who could have kids. Every time she went to worship, she was reminded that she couldn't have kids. And church, time before God, was taken away from her, and it no longer was a safe space. Let's pray. God, illuminate your spirit to us today. Lord, we want it when we want it. God, we we want to speed things up. It's just not how this works. So Lord, we have plans after service. Let us just let those pause for a little bit. And let us just focus on what you have before us. Because God, it is in prayer that you shape and you form us. And you tune our hearts to yours. Open our eyes and open our ears to what you have for us today.
of silence and just listen to what God has for you in this moment. God sees you, God hears you, and God is with you. And what connects us to saints of past and around the world, let's affirm our faith together with the reading of the Apostles' Creed. So let's please stand together with one another. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. in 1 Samuel this morning, there's a certain man named Ramatham, a zoophyte from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerome, son of Elhu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Panina. Panina had children and Hannah had none. Elkanah has two wives, one with kids and one without. What could go wrong? Right? What could go wrong here? As our readers, our mind goes to other stories in the Old Testament of those that couldn't have kids, the first wife or the second wife that is passed over. We hear stories of Sarai and Hagar, of Rachel and Leah. Because often in these times when a son couldn't be born to the first wife, bigamy was practiced so the line could continue on. But it never ended well. But in our stories, a son born to the barren woman or less favored always ends up being the point of the story. One had children while the other didn't. One could bear life, the other couldn't. Barren, childlessness. I think this hits a little home for all of us. Um, We all maybe have been personally touched by not being able to have kids. Um, Some of us have friends, uh, maybe even daughters, um, 
that haven't been able to have kids. And there's a huge pain that is found in that space. And it's deeply sorrowful when a mom is unable to have kids. Something I will never experience because I'm not a mom. But that's the setting of our story. A story of sorrow. And the story comes, continues on in verses 3 through 8. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Panina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? <laughs> Elkanah. Year after year, Sunday after Sunday, Sunday, pain and sorrow. They would go up from Shiloh. They would caravan together. They would sacrifice. They would worship. They would pray. A little bit of the, mud, of the meat would go to Panina, and then a bigger portion would go to Hannah, and she'd be unable to eat it. Scholars don't necessarily think that it's a bigger portion, but that he gave it to her in a more grandiose way. Instead of just getting a box of chocolates like Panina, she got flowers. She got a large box of chocolates, a life-size teddy bear. And then she was made fun of year after year. They would caravan together. They'd go to Shiloh. They would sacrifice. They would worship. They would pray. They'd be given some meat. Her rival would get some. She would get some, wouldn't be able to eat. And then she'd be made fun of. Year after year, they would worship. They'd go up to Shiloh. They'd sacrifice, worship, and pray. Get some meat. She wouldn't be able to eat. Then she would be made fun of. Year after year, Sunday after Sunday, we aren't told how long, but Hannah endured so much sorrow and pain. My mind goes to friends and family that have stepped away from the church because the church has become a space of sorrow and pain. It's a story of someone in their Bible study or prayer meeting where they share something that's deep that's happening in their life. And they've been holding on to it, but they feel like they need to share it because they need help, they need support. And as they share it, they feel better, they're prayed over, but then someone shares it outside of that group. And it starts weaving its way around different people. And that person comes in that following Sunday with their ears burning, knowing that they are no longer safe at church. And Sunday after Sunday, they find that they need to step away. Because what was once a place that was home is now a place of pain and sorrow. It's the story of a parishioner that comes to the pastor and says, I'm seeing abuse within the church. I'm seeing people being treated improperly, and this is not okay. But to save pace, the pastor decides to make them the scapegoat, that they're the problem. And everywhere they go, they are disinvited from spaces that they have called home. And now they're in pain. They can no longer be in church. We today have these stories, and maybe we bear these stories. Maybe we've endured stories like that. Maybe you are at Good Shepherd because you have endured pain from a previous church, and you find yourself here. I think we can identify with Hannah, but somehow Hannah remained. It could be because her livelihood was tied to her husband. It could be because she had nowhere else to go outside of her family unit. But it could also be that year after year, she worshiped and prayed. She offered sacrifice and she learned a God who provided, that God provided during the good years and the bad years, during drought and famine, and that he took care of them in the past. And year after year of sorrow was also met with year after year of intentional time in prayer with God. Deep sorrow alongside deep commitment led to prayer. And I can't let Elkanah get off the hook here. Let's look at these questions. Year after year, this is happening. Year after year. And these are the four questions he asks. Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downcast? Aren't I more than ten sons? 
He's a moron. <laughs> My goodness. Dude, read the room. <sighs> so if anything, you take anything away from this message, just say Elkanah is a moron. Goodness gracious. And the story goes on, verses 9 through 16. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but I give her, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Sorrow moved Hannah to take advantage of moments she had already been building. And sometimes all you can do is what the younger generation says is ugly cry. It's where you just let it all out and it doesn't matter. Sorrow has a way of moving us into the arms of God. And I've had my deep share of sorrow in just the past months. Not too long ago, my wife and I, we have a picture here. We left a wonderful church in Maryland because we felt God was moving us to the next step. And as we moved to this next step, we landed in a space, we moved away from family, friends, and connections, and we found that we were very, very alone. And then things started to happen in our family unit and in our extended family where we couldn't be with them. And I remember sitting there one night thinking, what did I do to my kids? I took them away from their grandparents? What kind of a dummy am I? And in those spaces of deep sorrow, all I can do is say, God, I don't know what to do, but I can just come to you. All I can do is cry out to God. But because of Hannah's continued pattern of both sorrow and worship, she knew where to go and who to go to. And so she went to God for the source of her peace. Hannah cries out and she makes a vow. And Eli overhears this, praying while no words are coming out. She is praying in the depths of her heart. And we've all been there before where we are praying with raw emotion where we are just saying, God, here it all is. This is all I have to give because I can't put coherent thoughts together. But God, I need you in this moment. And Eli misunderstands her as being drunk and not being in her right mind. And it is so hurtful when people misrepresent what we're going through, when we can't have someone to identify or empathize with our pain. Hannah is kind and she just corrects him and says, I'm praying out of deep anguish. Because when we pray from a place of, I've got nothing to lose, when we habitually pray things that make no sense to other people, people will question. People will say it's futile. Good people, good Christian people will misunderstand what you're going through. But prayer and allowing our hearts to be seen by God fully, that's never a bad thing. People will misunderstand the depths of your pain, but God will always understand it. And God will always hear you and welcome you. And God will meet you in the deepest depths that you find yourself in. Our story goes on, verses 17 through 18. Eli answered, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may the servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. From sorrow to joy, but nothing's really changed just yet. She went from weeping to sorrow to finally being able to eat when she couldn't eat the sacrifice. And joy starts to spring up in our narrative as Eli assures her that something good is coming. The ending in the story leaves me with just a few thoughts. Hannah's time with God gave her peace. Uh, time with God, an announcement from a very inept priest, as you continue to read in the story. But her circumstances didn't change yet. Uh, peace and healing can come from spending time with God. And our very anxious hearts need to be in the presence of our very non-anxious God. And it's with God that we find rest. 
And I think it's also true that God tends to answer more than what we ask for. Hannah asked for a son, and she got it. But she got so much more. She got safety. She has a son. She has lineage now. She can now take care of her physical body. She can eat. And now, year after year, where worship was a place of sorrow and deep pain and no longer safety, her rival can't say anything now. Often when we pray, God loves to say, hey, watch this, and surprise us. We are called to pray big, bold prayers, but we have a God who often says, just watch. God does answer her prayer and gives her a son, and she gives the son back, and Samuel becomes a very prominent figure, and he's the figure that kind of stitches the judges to the monarchy, where he anoints King David, the one in the line of Jesus. And Hannah is a prime example of this. If we aren't willing to put ourselves in this is crazy situations, we'll never experience this is awesome. She had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And these are some of the most fun prayers a church can pray. Let's pray. God, you are good. God, you are here. Lord, my prayer is that if church is a place of sorrow, that Lord, you bring healing. And then if it's up to us to make systemic changes, Lord, let us do that work. Let us clear the debris for you to work and for people to find a home here in this space. Week after week, year after year, we should find rest in your house, not pain. And so, Lord, my prayer is that people find rest within our body, within this church. Thank you, Lord. Amen.